state style. It's Yahoo. It is straight, Calgarian. Was that educated Calgarian? <laughs> I went to the uh, the parade. I saw the beginning part. And I know it's Yahoo. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the spirit of the stampede. And according to the spirit of the stampede, we have, it's like a reunion today. A lot of returnees. They have Dan and his, his friends, or you know, back. Mission trip back over there. Heidi back, and you know, just Warren Trenton, just like a reunion. And uh, maybe God wants you to hear a special message today, so you can repent. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing um, everyone today, including those who've been away. I thank you that you have watched over them, and now they're here before your presence. And I ask that you would encourage them with your word, speak to them, speak to all of us, and help us to know that you're a living God, and that you are our Savior. And give us faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ died for the church. The church is called the bride of Christ and the body of Christ in the Bible. The church is the reason that Christ came. And yet, statistics in America show that the church is in decline. Although in Calgary, I see a lot of churches. Every year, more than 4,000 churches close their doors. Every year, 2.7 million church members fall into inactivity. The United States now ranks third following China and India in the number of people who are not professing Christians, which makes them an unreached people group. In Europe, it's reported that only 2 to 4% of the population attend church. The church is in decline. I don't want to join this statistic. Do you? The passage today that we read, Paul shows us what we must do. Five areas in our lives that we need to take action in order for us to build a healthy church. Can you guys read that? It's supposed to mean kapish. Kapish. And kapish, it's spelled, I know technically that kapesh is how you would probably read it, but I meant to refer to kapish. And kapish means, do you understand? Or do you get it? It's an acrostic for the five areas in our lives that Paul wants us to pay attention to. Now Paul, he's been talking about this. He said, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you, you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. And he's been talking about putting your old self away and putting on the new. And he's been talking about this in theological language, but now, in the passage we read, he talks about practical ways in the five areas of our lives. Character. Your possessions, emotion, speech, and heart. Can you guys say that? Character. Possessions. Emotion. Speech. And heart. Kapish. Kapish. These are the areas that Paul addresses in our lives. Number one is see our character. He says, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. To tell the truth, to be honest, because we are members of one another. 
Jack Welch was named the manager of the century by Fortune magazine. Manager of the century. While he was CEO of General Electric, General Electricity in the United States, his company rose, the worth of his company rose 4,000%. He's a man of authority in terms of managing. But he says, in managing a company, the best form of management is the truth. The best form of management is the truth. And what he says is, people, they have the right to know the truth about where they stand in the company. And people, they have the right to know the truth of who they are. And truth, he says, makes the company grow. And even though it's difficult, there needs to be an atmosphere of openness in a group for it to grow. To tell the truth. Now, telling the truth to people in terms of Confronting people is not easy, especially in the West. I think it's because of the individualistic mindset that we have. We don't want to get in people's faces. We just let people do what they are. Mind your own business kind of mentality. There was a junior high boy who did an experiment on this. Whether people would say something in public if he did something wrong. So what he did was he would in front of a, uh, a restaurant or a fast food uh, place, he would cut in line. He would just kind of sneak in there like, you know, you go to Tim Hortons, he would just kind of, <laughs> kind of cut right in the middle to see if what people would do. He did this over 20 times and he, video, he videotaped it. None of the people said anything. And if they did say anything, they just kind of wondered. You know, it's kind of like, no one confronted this boy except for one lady out of over 20. We don't like to confront people. We're not used to it. But if we are honest with ourselves and if we love our brothers and sisters and family, we need to tell the truth. And we need to reveal the truth to one another. Now when, when I was in high school, I had an opportunity to tell the truth and I didn't. And there were devastating, uh, kind of, it affected a group of us, a group of people. And this was a situation. I was on a track team and it was a four by 100 relay and there were four people on the team, and each person ran 100 meters. And we were one meet away from the state championship. But this meet, it conflicted with our senior trip. And so one of the members, the second leg of our 4x100, he wanted to go on this senior trip. But he felt guilty, and he approached me and to ask if it was okay for him to go on the senior trip and skip the meet and have a replacement. I knew in my heart that if he did not join us, we had no chance or very little chance of winning that race. But I didn't want to say that and make him feel guilty and not go on the senior trip so I said, you know, it's up to you. And that was one of the worst choices that I made. Because the replacement that came, as he went on the senior trip, he was not able to pass the baton from his leg to the third leg. And we had a strong team. And because of that, we lost our chance of going to a state championship. And going to the state championship, 
and you, you know, you had your airfare paid for, and you don't just race, right? After the race, it was held in Anaheim, California. You had an opportunity also to go to Disneyland, you know, fully paid for. But because I didn't care enough for our team, and I didn't speak the truth to Charles, Charles Mott, our whole team suffered. So it's very important. In the same way, Jesus says, and Paul says, as a body of Christ, we need to learn to be honest and to be truthful to one another. And Jack Welch, he also mentions that in the company, when a company reaches, a when there's a recession, they have to lay off people. And the first people that get laid off are those who are low producing. Now, there was a lady who worked in the company for 25 years, for 25 years, and she was laid off. Why? Because she was low producing. But his point was, for 25 years, nobody approached her and told her the things that she needed to improve. Nobody cared enough to tell her what she needed to do. So, after working 25 years, she never improved and she was laid off. If we care enough about people, we would tell them the truth. And as a person who hears the truth as well, it goes the other way. We need to learn to accept the truth about ourselves. We need to be honest about who we are. Confrontation is not easy. But sometimes we need to speak the truth. The second area that Paul says we need to pay attention to is P, possessions. Paul says, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Paul here is not just talking about stealing. He's talking about becoming a giver. Instead of taking, Paul is saying, learn to give. Here he says, performing with his own hands. And the reason why Paul mentions hands here is because he's alluding to, you know the hands you used to take? Now, I want you to use your hands and work in order to give. So that he will have something to share with one who has need. We need to learn to give. That's another way of putting on the new. Before, many of us, we work. Many of us, you know, we have savings. A lot of it is for ourselves. And Paul here is saying the new. Put on the new and learn to give and not just take. Work to give. And in, in the world, there are 5% of top leaders. And 1% of the 5%, they have a characteristic that's common to them all. And this characteristic is generosity. When members, uh, their employees, or the people who, lead, who they lead do well, they give them a lot of benefits, a lot of raise. They're generous. They're not generous with the money just for the sake of giving them raises. They have a generous heart because they want to see others succeed. They thrive on seeing other people succeed in what they do. In the same way, Paul, here he's saying, I want you to be a giver and not just a taker. In the possessions, Paul says, give. And God, when we begin to 
become selfish with our belongings. <coughs> when we begin to hoard our belongings, he's not happy. There's a story in the Old Testament, David and Nabal. And David, when he was running, running from Saul, he was uh, like a bandit and he had 400, 400 people following him. He used to protect the property of a man named ba uh, Nabal. His sheep, you know, his, uh, his cattle, and, and, and the shepherds would roam around in the fields and David would protect them. And when David became, became in need, he went to Nabal and asked him during a, a festival time, said, um, you know, your servant David, you know, we're in need. Can you, whatever you have, can you spare some of your stuff for us? And Nabal responded, why should I give my stuff, my sheep, which I prepare for my people, for you? I don't know you. And the story goes that David became so furious that he was going to go and kill everything that belonged to Nabal. And Abigail, Nabal's wife, cal comes and calms him down, calms David down, and stops David from coming. But in the end, God strikes Nabal dead. And so, Nabal, who didn't learn to give, who didn't learn to share what he had, was punished by God. God loves a cheerful giver. So, Paul says, with our possession, we need to learn to give. Third, emotions. We need to learn to control and release our emotion. The emotion that Paul talks about is anger. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. Anger is a very strong emotion. And it can lead us to lose our control and lead us to say and do things we will regret. And so we have the expression, right, I lost my temper. We lose our temper because in this expression it suggests there's an element of going out of control. Like a lion that's on the loose. And the Bible says our anger, human anger, it rarely leads to God's righteousness. Some of the biblical examples are Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel out of anger. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph's, Joseph's brother sold jo him into slavery out of anger. Saul and David. Saul began to chase David around. And I know that anger, when we act out of this emotion, it doesn't produce the righteousness of God. I remember experiencing this as a kid from my dad. Now, my dad used to discipline me, and one day I knew that he was disciplining me out of anger and not out of wanting to show me what I did wrong. And he got a broomstick, and you could hear, when I was in junior high, and you could hear him swing. And he hit me so hard on the calves. And he disciplined me many, many times. But this time he hit me so hard. And I knew, I knew that he was not doing it out of love. He was doing it out of his anger. He was angry. And the um, only thing that I can remember was that I wasn't right. Now at another time, my dad, he disciplined me. Now, as a kid, sometimes you sometimes disrespect your parents, right? We don't give them the kind of credit they deserve, okay? And I know my son Elijah, he doesn't give me the, the day and time that I deserve, right? Well, I was the same way, and same around the same age, and I remember my dad took me out one day, and he did one of these kung fu moves he took me down in less than a, a half a second. I don't know what he did. All I knew was I was on the ground, 
And he was looking at me, I was like, Dad, respect. You don't have to do anything more. But at that time, he disciplined me to show me that I need to show respect to uh, parents and elders. And I didn't have any bad feelings toward my dad because I knew he didn't do it out of anger. He was doing it to show me. Yeah, I gotta learn that from my dad and use it on my kid. <laughs> Bam! Mm -hmm. So him to have some respect for his elders. So the anger of God doesn't produce, I mean the ang anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. And the wisdom book in the Bible, it rejects this anger. It says, do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. Ecclesiastes 7, 9. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. Proverbs 15, 18. Scorners set a city aflame, but wise men turn away anger. Proverbs 29, 8. And what we need to do, we can't avoid anger. Sometimes it, 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 it kind of boils up. Paul says, let it go. No, let it go. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's Paul's point here. We need to let go and not act act on our anger. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. This, Paul is not talking about like a limitation of time. He's not saying if you're angry, but the sun goes down tonight, you need to let go of your anger. That's not what it really means. If it really meant that, you know, people who live in Calgary, they have more time, right? You have until like 10, 30, 11 in the summer. But shorter in the winter, right? And you only have until 5 p.m., that I feel this anger. That's not what it means. The people who live in the, in the Arctic, right? Eskimos, no time limitation. The sun doesn't go down. That's not what he's talking about here. He's saying what you need to do is you need to learn to let go. Okay? As soon as you can, don't let the emotion control you. You stay in control. Because why? Satan uses anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. If you allow anger to remain, it's like a thorn on the side, okay? That pricks you, okay? Don't be like those type A blood types, right? You know what they say about type A blood types? They're very sensitive, and every little thing, you know, that... You, you touch them, and you say, they remember after years and years, 10, 20 years, remember when you said that to me, right? And you come back, <laughs> right? Now I'm going to get you back. You don't be like that. And I remember telling you guys the story of um, a junior high girl where I had said some things, and she held on to it for years, and it really ate her up. And only in college did she just explode. Right? She's like a volcano just exploded and all these things she said to me and she regretted it. She was crying and in the end, that Sunday she said, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jen, that I said that. You regret things when, when, when you do it out of anger. We need to let it go. Paul says, emotions, control it and release it. Paul actually bases what he says on this Old Testament verse, Psalm 545. Tremble in anger and do not sin. And that's the whole point. That we don't sin against God. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be, and be still. Okay? It's kind of hard, right? When you're angry. Just meditate, just think about it. You just think of all those ways you want to get back at that person who wronged you. Okay, it could be somebody close to your family, too. That's a scary thing. And he says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust. Trust in God. And it's this trusting, when we trust God, right? When somebody wrongs us, like God, when we put our trust in God, that's going to help us to just let go. Do you have an anger towards someone today? 
maybe your friend or family member. You need to trust that situation and give it to God. Okay? Don't hold on to it. Let it go. Romans 12, 19 says, Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And God is just. And He's going he's gonna to take care of it. We need to trust, let Him do His job. But as for us, we let go. But second, speech. Speech. And Paul says, with your speech, your, your speech is so powerful. What you say, the words. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such as word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Solomon, one of the great kings of the Bible, and he's the writer of many wisdom literature in the Bible, said, the tongue has the power of life and death. There are good words and bad words, just as there are good fruit and bad fruit. When you go into superstore and you're picking out fruit, there's good banana, bad banana, good pepper, bad pepper, right? When you eat the, when you eat the bad fruit, bad pepper, it's sour to the stomach. In the same way, there are good words and bad words. That word unwholesome, that actually is used to refer to good fruit and bad fruit in the Bible. When Jesus says, no tree, no good tree can bear bad fruit, that's the word. It means rotten, unwholesome. And our words could be the same way that comes out of our mouth. And so he's saying, be careful in choosing your words and what you say. Don't spray. Say, right? <laughs> Don't spray. It's like, and Proverbs says this, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And Paul says, we need to speak to build up, to heal to speak with a purpose. Okay, what is the purpose for why we're saying what we say? Now, there's a book called The Five Love Languages. And here, Dr. Chapman, one of the five love languages is called the words of affirmation. Some people, they feel loved through words that they hear, words of affirmation. And in this book, Dr. Chapman talks about he, he tells a story that speaks to the power of positive words. And so there was a lady. She couldn't get her husband to paint the room. And she continued to nag him. Honey, why aren't you painting the room? Why aren't you painting the room? And nothing she did would make her paint the room. So she came for advice and asked Dr. Chapman what she should do. And she, she told, or Dr. Chapman told her, does your husband do anything good around the house? And she was like, hmm, like what, right? <laughs> and he said, well, does, she take out, does he take out the garbage? Does he take care of the bills? And she was like, yeah, he, she does that. Well, when he does one good thing, I want you to compliment him. When he takes out the garbage, I want you to say, wow, Thanks for taking out the garbage. That was great. Or when he does the bill, writes the bill and takes care of the finances, she should say, honey, thanks for taking care of the bills. Not a lot of husbands do that, but you do. I really appreciate it. Little things, appreciating little things and saying them in order to affirm with a, with a purpose to build up, right? And she was like, I don't know how that's going to get the room painted. Right? And he said, well, you asked for my advice. There it is. You can do them or not. So she went home. Three weeks later, she came back. Ecstatic. Dr. Chapman. 
He painted the room. He painted the room. And that's what she did. She gave, gave him words of affirmation. And Dr. Chapman goes on to say, verbal compliments are far greater motivators than nagging words. Verbal compliments are far greater motivators than nagging words. So, speak to build up. Choose good words, not rotten words. But you know what this requires of us? This, in order for us to speak, words to encourage, to comfort, to affirm, we need to know what's going on in people's lives. He says, Paul says, say words to meet a need. If we don't know what's going on in people's lives, if we don't know what their needs are, then we don't know what to say. If we're not concerned about other people, there's no way we can say something to meet a need. We wouldn't know if they need comfort. We wouldn't know if they need encouragement. We wouldn't know if they need words of affirmation. Do you need a word of encouragement today? Do you need a word of comfort? Do you need a word of affirmation? We all do in our life. The word encourage means to inspire courage. The word encourage means to inspire courage. And you know, some of us, we have in our hearts dreams. We have in our hearts potential that's waiting to wake up. If someone would just encourage us, say, hey, Grace, you're good at that. And you should pursue that. Just one word of encouragement can make a difference in our life and in our church community. Let our words heal. Lastly, H, our hearts. Paul says, be forgiving. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Did you know that we can grieve God's heart? Did you know that God, He feels if we can grieve him. In Genesis, when it says that God saw that the inclination of the hearts of people was violence all the time, it says that God was grieved. He was so grieved. When he sees violence, when he sees, like Ben was sharing today, how you know Christians are being executed, not only Christians, but the war in Syria and all that, God is grieved. Not only out there, but in here in our hearts. When there's a war going on, when there's bitterness, and when there's hatred, God is grieved. And so, Paul says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. Be forgiving. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, I've been talking about a lot of things that we should do. And there is a, a commonality, common focus that all these areas, the five areas, capiche comes from. Being honest, controlling our anger, learning to give our positions, okay? saying things to build up, and having a forgiving heart. They have a common purpose and a source. What is that source? It's love. When you look at the reasons for why Paul tells us to do things, these things, all his reasons are for the other person. It's for the other person. Look at the first reason. Tell the truth because you're members of one another. Don't deceive. Okay? Stop stealing and work to give. Why? So you can share and meet a need. Somebody who has a need, you can meet it. How about anger, right? Don't let Satan, right, break up 
Words. Let the words build up your heart. Forgive. All these are for the other. Love is something that you do for someone else. Love is something you do for someone else and not something that you do for yourself. And what that means is we can choose to love. We can choose to do these things for the other. You know, many of us, especially me, we live by our feelings. We live by our feelings, our emotions, what we like to do. If we feel like it, we do it. If we don't feel like it, we don't do it. But here, what Paul is saying is, you choose to put on this new life, the Christian life that Christ gave us. You choose to put it on. You choose to love. You choose to tell the truth. You choose to work so that you can be able to share your belongings with others. And you know, this past week, I'm, I'm, I'm really an emotional guy. I don't know if you guys know that. Am I? Am I? <laughs> I am. And so, um, when I get happy, I get really excited. You guys heard my laugh, right? Some of you guys probably were surprised and startled by my laugh. You know, like, ah! I was like, what in the world was that? <laughs> so when I get you know, excited, I really let it show. But at the same time, when I get angry, it really shows. You guys don't know. It's, None of you guys have angered me yet. <laughs> but in the home, you know, yeah, in the home, you know, my anger, you know, I get really emotional. And this past week, um, my wife and I, you know, we had a big fight about, you know, it's usually about kids raising Elijah, you know. I'm more strict, she's not. She's the protective type, I'm the police type, you know. And so, you know, always fight over that. And, and it was a big argument. And um, for me, it's really hard to control my anger in my heart. And it takes a long time. By the way, I'm type A. So watch <laughs> what you say. <laughs> watch what you say. I may have to know. <laughs> I won't let the sun go down before I get rid of it. But God was saying, this is the, I mean, this is probably the most quickest, the less time, the least amount of time it took for me to get rid of this emotional kind of anger thing. Because through this message, you know, we choose it. We can choose to let go. But you know what motivates It's love. I do it because I love my wife and because I love God. I choose to do it. Will you choose to live for your brother and sister in Christ? Will you choose to build up and not bring down? When you choose to tell the truth, you're choosing love. When you choose to be patient, and release that anger, you're choosing love. When you choose to work to give, you're choosing love. When you choose words to build up and not bring down, you do it because you love, you're choosing love. When you choose to forgive, you do so because you have been loved by God and you are choosing to love others. You have the power God has given you the power to choose. And you can choose love. Fadish? Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray, as you have loved us in Christ, I pray that our motivation in these five areas of our lives C-P-E-S-H Character, possessions, emotion, speech, and heart 
would arise out of our hearts for others. And I pray, Father, let these characteristics be in our lives and in this church so that you may build up this church for your glory. In Jesus' name.